Hello, I'm David Brownlee. I'm a professor in the History of Art Department. This podcast is one of three that we've prepared to help you look at the two great paintings by Thomas Aikens that we'll be discussing in the Penn Reading Project in September as part of Freshman Orientation Weekend. This one is the Gross Clinic, painted in 1875. And this is the Agnew Clinic, painted in 1889, and it's shown here with my colleague, Dr. Kathleen Foster, the Curator of American Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Dr. Foster will introduce you individually to these two paintings in the other two podcasts. I'll be talking to you briefly about how you should go about looking at works of art in general. My goal is to help you look at a painting, here the Gross Clinic, with the same kind of confidence and intensity that you bring to reading a novel or a poem. Confident that you can understand it and have something to say about it without having to look at secondary literature and have someone else tell you what you should see in it. That may seem like a daunting task, but you're fully equipped to handle it, and you'll find that the skills that you've already developed in literary analysis carry over to looking at paintings. Like literature, visual art is a powerful synthesis of structure and content, of form and meaning, we might say. And although these two things are always bound up with each other, I think to start with, and from time to time along the way, it's helpful to think about them separately. Let's start with physical structure. Works of literature have this too, although we tend to forget about it and its enormous impact. A play that is four acts organizes our experience in a way different from a poem with 120 verses. The narrative structure of a novel may be balanced, symmetrical, you might say, or lopsided, emphasizing one part of the story or one character. The chosen vocabulary may be refined and elevated, or coarse and unsophisticated, or of course it may be a mixture or something in between. Even more emphatically than works of literature, works of visual art, this is the Agnew Clinic, are first of all physical objects. They derive much of their power from this, and I think it's useful to begin by thinking about a painting as a thing, and by analyzing it in the same way that we analyze other things, by locating it on the various continua of possibility on which physical objects exist. Very simply, for starters, a painting can be big. It can be small. What is different about the way we are affected by the little sketch of the Gross Clinic and the full-size final painting? A painting can also have a large or small scale. That is to say, objects within a painting can be large or small relative to the size of the painting. Think about how Vincent van Gogh shapes our impression of these sunflowers by filling his canvas with them. By the way, this painting, like all the paintings that I'll be comparing to the two clinics by Aikens, is on view at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was painted in the same year as the Agnew Clinic. Paintings can be horizontal or vertical or square or round or oval in their overall shape, and the objects within them can be organized in myriad ways, symmetrically or asymmetrically, orthogonally or diagonally, hierarchically, or in a way that suggests equivalence. These two paintings by Aikens are very different in almost every physical and organizing structure. And by choosing to do things one way in one painting and differently in the other, Aikens sets up relationships among objects in the paintings and between those objects and the viewer that are very importantly different. A painting can be dark in overall tonality, something that Aikens cultivated in the Gross Clinic, or bright, like the Impressionist painting of a seaside cliff painted 10 years later by Claude Monet. Aikens clearly chose this tonality to create a mood. So did Monet. Lines can be straight, and of course lines can be curved. Very rarely, an artist like Piet Mondrian will adopt the discipline of using just one type of form. More common is the studied mixture of curves and straight lines that Henry Ozawa Tanner, who was an Aiken student, used in this part of his painting, The Annunciation. It's a painting, by the way, that hangs in the same room as the Agnew Clinic at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The surfaces of a painting can be rough, like the sea of paint that tumbles over Dr. Gross's face. Or the surfaces can be smooth, like the burnished countenance of this Polish princess, 
painted by Franz Winterhalter just a few years before Aikens depicted Dr. Gross. Those physical characteristics, which we see outside us, arouse different feelings inside us. Space can seem palpably deep and real in paintings, as I think you see in the work of Aikens. Or the space in paintings can seem very shallow, with all objects pressed close to the front on just a little shelf of space, like Van Gogh's sunflowers. Some painters make objects seem realistically three-dimensional with shading and perspective, while others emphasize outline and surface rather than three-dimensionality. Taken together, the decisions made by the artist shape the encounter between the viewer and the painting. You're sometimes invited into the fictional space of the painting, again, something that many feel in Aiken's work. And you sometimes find the objects in a painting brought out to the surface and almost into your own space. You may feel that about the pot of yellow flowers. These fundamental, powerful, physical things reflect creative choices made by the artist. And anyone who tries to analyze a work of art has a responsibility to understand why things are one way and not the other. Why it is small, not large why it is rough, not smooth, why it is asymmetrically composed rather than symmetrically composed. There are answers to those questions, and they are generally answers that will lead you toward an understanding of the meaning of the work. Now, beyond the effects wrought by the physical nature of a painting, paintings affect us by causing us to contemplate things outside themselves, taking us to places and or to times that are at least a little bit away from the painting on the wall and its viewer at this moment. This other place in time is always something that the artist has constructed. In some cases, it may be downright imaginary. But even an overtly naturalistic painting like the Gross Clinic is a piece of skillful contrivance, telling us something about the doctor and his place in the world that an ordinary encounter with the man himself would not yield. Broadly speaking, paintings function as communicative devices on several levels. And although a bit obvious, I think it's useful to think about the various levels at which a work of art can communicate, the different modes in which it can speak to us. As noted, it functions first of all as a purely physical object whose colors, shapes, and textures influence us. Beyond that, a painting may describe or portray something that is so familiar to us that it needs no analysis or special knowledge as when we see a person on the street or in a painting and recognize it as a fellow human being. Behind this first order recognition come a number of things that we can say because we understand what elements in the painting represent. We see a human dressed in 19th century dress and the clothing of a particular class and equipped with a particular set of implements, all of which explains to us what is going on in ways that we could not understand unless we came with some knowledge of medicine, 19th century dress, and the hierarchy of privilege in Western society. The way that we are led into an understanding of these paintings by our knowledge of the use, the meaning, and perhaps the symbolism of the things in them is what art historians call iconography. This second level of meaning, the iconography, is sometimes a good deal more complicated that's the case in Thomas Couture's Thorny Path, painted only two years before Aikens began work on the Gross Clinic, and also all in view at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This painting is a satire of decadent French society. A stylish courtesan, dressed in impractical white, drives a carriage pulled not by horses, but by four male human captives who represent different follies of the time. They stagger along a literally thorny path, while a decrepit figure in the rear of the carriage foreshadows the joyless future that they face. Once we understand the iconography of a painting, and fortunately for us, most of what we see in the Gross and Agnew clinics is familiar, the painting invites us to broader understandings. Exploring this further area is for me almost always the most interesting part of the study of a work of art. A painting is a window into a culture and a world, 
and framing not just what particular people are doing in a particular place, but also calling our attention to what their activity signifies more broadly, what their activity tells us about the society that surrounds them and the times in which they live. In the case of Aikens, this is about Philadelphia and America in the period after the Civil War, when empirical science transformed transportation, communication, and healthcare, when industry concentrated people as never before in cities, and when an expanding economy propelled Americans to settle a continent. Such stories and others stand behind these paintings. And of course, the same kind of broader understanding stand behind every work of visual art or literature. But while there are important similarities, there's one great difference between a painting and a work of literature, a dissimilarity that you need to bear in mind. And that is, when you first see a book on the shelf, it rarely makes a significant first impression. By contrast, a painting always makes a first impression, and an enormous amount of what we think, of what we feel about a painting comes from those first moments of encounter. For you and me, one of the great challenges in looking at these paintings is to make sure that that first highly important impression is remembered and analyzed. And to do that, you really need to spend time with the paintings that I've been talking about in person at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But we also have to ensure that that is only the first impression and that we go through the front door offered by these powerfully physical and sensuously visual creations and go inside to explore all that they are ready to tell us.